we uh, we are on. Okay. Uh, I'm very good, thank you. I am very good indeed. Uh, yeah, really good. Considering I was the night before last, I was I was getting sick, as in the physical act of getting sick for the first time since 2006. What crazy? Sick? No, 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 not no, not not Corona sick. Uh, everyone, everyone in uh, everyone in, in Kate's house basically all got ill. <laughs> everyone got ill. <laughs> everyone got sick. Yeah. No, I started with the youngest, just 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 vomiting, just a bug, and then um, and then I got it. Kate got it, and her her son got it. No, uh, was that had they gone back? Had she gone back to school? Did she pick it up there. No. Uh oh. Very weird. Are you good now? Anyway. Pardon. You're good now. Very good. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. It was horrible. Yes, it was horrible. Today I'm good. Today I'm very good. Are you? Uh, you going to be a race driver then? Seems that way. Yeah. Well, see if see what happens with this whole uh, lockdown thing. But yeah, I'm not sure about the plans for uh, learning at the moment. But certainly, racing is is back on in August. I think. Fingers crossed. You have to get a then you have to get a, a racing license, like a racing driver's license. Yes, you do. You have to do I think you have to have a half a day with an instructor or something and get to Is it? Yeah, it's I think it's quite easy to get a license. But then to to get an international license, I think you have to race a few times and get ticked off by the marshal and all this kind of stuff. I'm not entirely sure of the process, to be honest. The boss is will take me through it. But I'm going to be having a couple of lessons with Natalie McGloin. You know, Natalie? She's the tetraplegic uh, racing driver. Yes, I, yes, yes. I didn't know the name. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so she's going to teach me a few times, and then I'm going to have a couple of lessons with a, a pro instructor. And go from there, really. But it's all a bit up in the air, you know, with all the plans, obviously, like everyone's plans are. What What, what are you, like, driving anyway? Uh, <laughs> well, I'm pretty good at driving. Like, I, mean, I love driving. And that's a start, I think. I'm pretty, I'm a bit of a cruiser, I suppose, but. What, um, what, what, hang on, what do you mean, cruiser? I don't, well, you know, I just like. Like South End, South End on Sea. Window down, one hand on the steering wheel. Yeah, neon feet's going. Under the... <laughs> um, no, I told I told the boss I drive like Miss Daisy. He said it's okay. I'll teach you how to drive fast. And I was like, okay, that sounds good. <laughs> uh, but the more I think about it, the more excited I'm I'm getting about it. And actually, I think I'll probably feel safer in a car than I than I did on a racehorse. Yeah, I know what you mean. It'll it, yeah. uh, it must make it must make people a more more confident and better drivers on the road. That's still I mean I've never I've never raced, but um I've done like obviously with the military loads of off roading. Yeah. Because of that, I I don't bat an eyelid on the road. Really. I just don't bat an eyelid at all. It's just it having a different experience, a bit of risk associated with it. Makes the road look like normal roads, like normal. Yeah. Which, which they are. Yeah, no, it's exciting. But I found myself um, now when I'm driving. I pretend like I'm a racing driver, you know, not with the speed, <laughs> not with the speed but I don't get to imagine with me with a helmet on in a race suit and that and it all gets quite exciting. It makes driving a little bit more fun. Just don't, just, I mean, indulge yourself a bit, but don't go buying those um, drive-in gloves, you know, leather ones. I was, I was working at um, a place in, honestly, people are mental. I was working at a place in Birmingham, you before you before last before I joined in my sad, yeah. And this this he had this contractor come in and do some work. He's a builder. He a builder, builder, yeah. And uh, he would turn up in this like rear wheel drive Mazda, whatever it was, you know, the, the one of the older models, but cool two seater, cool little fun chuck around thing. He was about, I'd say, he was coming on at sixty years old, yeah. And he used to get out of the car, and he'd have jeans on, a black t shirt, and he'd have. He'd have a pair of, uh, like they were like plim soles almost, but they were they were basically racing drivers, old school, made of leather shoes. 
like no soles, just like so your, your foot's as, as like close to the pedals as you can get it. Basically, but they were pure leather. And he had um, he had the old fingerless black leather driving gloves with the holes out the knuckles. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> Crazy. But, but think, thinking he's thinking he's um, thinking he's Mansell driving driving in some factory in Birmingham. Good for him. How did it come about? How did it all come about? Well, it's it's really exciting actually, and it's um, lockdown's done us you know quite well because so Peter um, who lives over in. Uh, uh, Switzerland. It was his sort of vision to have a, a racing team for veterans, because he lives over in Closters and he was helping the um, the skiing with heroes. And so he was very impressed by the sort of fortitude and tenacity and you know overcoming adversity of these of these veterans that were skiing. And he had been in racing. You know, he was a race driver himself always worked in motorsport and his grandmother was a, a racing driver as well. And so he decided to set up this, um, this racing initiative basically and, uh, racing heroes. And it's sort of, it's just growing and evolving and he's been working on it for, I think the past four years, pulling all the pieces together. And then I got involved last year. So Peter and I had been friends on Facebook and, um, it was Armed Forces Day, and I posted a picture of me in um, in green, um, you know, with a little bit of blurb about the the army. And he said, "Oh, I never realised you're in in the army. Would you consider being part of my team?" So I was like, "Yeah, of course." So always have a chat about everything, and and that was it, really. And then um, a couple of guys as well, Tim and James, um, are also involved, and and it's all sort of coming together. Um, but along with that as well, um, the, t the sponsor for the team is a Swiss energy drink uh, called 81, and I do have a can here. Um, <laughs> and actually, we're, we'll be bringing that a, over to the UK a, as well. you got a jacket as well. I might have the jacket on too. <laughs> <laughs> why, is it called, why is it called 81? Uh, well, the main guy, it's something to do with, so the main guy is actually uh, Hell's Angel, uh, Pitt, and he, it's also to do, oh gosh, I can't remember, this is terrible, the 81st Bomber Division, okay. yeah? I don't know, I was just thinking of, I was thinking of the 81 millimeter mortar. No, I don't, I don't, maybe there is something to do with that, I don't know. Um, but so, so we'll be bringing that over to the UK and then every can sold, 2P goes to the charity to, um, you pay for the training for veterans and in technicians, drivers, um, logistics, engineers, you know, the whole gambit basically. And we're partnered with some, some cracking racing teams as well. So Redline Racing, who are sort of champ. I think they've been champions over 10 times in the Porsche Carrera Cup. And, um, but the ultimate aim is to get to Le Mans and field a male and a female team. That's awesome. That'd be awesome. Yes, yeah. yeah, so it's awesome. really, really exciting. Really exciting. Yeah. I love the whole family, you know. It's very, um, very close-knit. We're all looking out for each other. So how many drivers are, are there at the minute? Or... Uh, potential drivers how many are going to be on the team so at the moment we're working with two pro drivers um young, young up-and-coming talent so we'll be training on the vehicles uh, on the porsches and they'll be driving and natalie has also joined the team as well um so actually her technician is um james he's a uh Remy and oh. was discharged so he does her her technical bits and pieces but you know she I mean she's incredible because she's driving you know she steers with her left hand and does all the you know all the actions with her right hand because obviously she's paralyzed um but she's winning races and all sorts you know so it's really exciting so she's not got the use of her legs nope so she's steering with the left hand and yep. she's gear changing accelerating braking well, yeah, those things. With a and, ha oh, and a handbrake. 
With it? Oh, in fact, <laughs> I believe so. Well, it's not rallying, but I haven't yeah. seen it in action yet, but I'm sure I will do soon. But it's quite remarkable because it because you, then you're really leveling out the the playing field. You know, like anyone can compete in in a race it doesn't you don't have to have a, a you know a special para series or something it's it's everyone's everyone's equal when you're out there um and there's a couple of other guys um injured guys that we're chatting to as well so we'll just see it's growing and evolving very quickly no, that's cool i'll have to put you in touch with um a friend of mine and a, a, a power edge guy i've just interviewed him actually okay. for 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 this he's a falcons veteran but he may be able to offer us maybe able to offer assistance anywhere somewhere he's been in the motorsports industry for i don't know like 30 odd years but he deals with catering so he, he's got a catering business but okay. specifically for motorsports you never know for stuff down the line i'll connect you up with him oh, sure. he's called, he lives in london called terry wood terry wood okay that yeah that'd be awesome yeah bit of a character good yeah. we love those yeah was uh, was rolling around the Falcons when they took Port Stanley, stealing vehicles off of the Marines. <laughs> oh, no way! Do you know I, you do? I lived with a Falkland vet actually when I was in France. Really? Yeah, yeah. Power two power guy. Who was that? I don't want to say. I don't think he'd want me to say his name, to be honest. Oh, right then. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's quite private. So. Oh, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah, it's fine. But um, the stories were incredible. Yeah, there's so many stomach stuff that gets lost between the 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 cracks over the years, you know. Yeah. yeah. But um, are you going to race? Will you race full time then? Is that your job then? Because you got other stuff on your plate as well, haven't you? Uh, I'm juggling quite a lot of balls, to be honest. I'm, but I I I kind of need to do that uh, to to remain sane. But um, I'm not sure how it's going to work. I'm I'm very much rolling with it, and um, and just whatever whatever comes, I'll I'll do whatever needs to be done. But yeah, there is there are quite a few projects on the on the go. Which so you, your training is going to be in Silverstone. I believe so. I'm not sure yet. None of none of it's confirmed because of what's going on. Yeah, but it's it's not it's not like anything's not going to happen. It's just it's just a delay, right? Yeah, it's just delayed. Yeah, so I should be probably going around Silverstone. Natalie lives up around there, so we shall probably go out. Um, I think she has a a golf as well because she has a, a charity as well, um, getting uh, disabled people out into into the cars too. Be great. We have to uh, do an intro to it if you don't mind. It'd be great to go on the podcast. Yeah, absolutely. And she's, not, and she's not far away either. Not far away at all. Not far away at all. What's been going on since, uh, apart from the racing, what's been going on since the last interview? When was that? Uh, was it mid mid last year? I reckon it's got to be about the same time. I think it must be about a year exactly. I'm sure it is. Really? Yeah. Yeah, that would be freaky. That would be freaky. Let's have a look. That would be freaky. Janie, wait, I'm Googling it. Janie McGill, HR. Number 57. Oh, I t- flip her neck. 15th of June. It released on the 15th of June. So we've been a week before. About the same time. What's happened since? So you were, uh, do you want to talk about anything you've been setting up? I don't know how much you want to say about it. Well, last year was a bit of a funny one because my dad died. And um, so I got back from Oman. He went straight into a hospice for three months. So everything was put on hold while, you know, while the inevitable came. And then really the rest of the year was a bit, I don't, I, well, I think I was processing everything that went on in the desert. Uh, you know, that month I spent walking in the, in the empty quarter and a lot you know, I went to sort out a lot of things in my head over that, for that. So there was a lot of um, processing of that. And then obviously processing the death of my father as well. So really that last half of the year, last year, is all a bit of a blur, to be honest. You know, I did odd jobs, did a lot of thinking. Um, 
started putting plans into place, you know, thinking about writing the book and putting the book pitch together. And then I was waiting for the, the Land Rover film to come out from the desert um, because they provided vehicles for us. Um, so that was also delayed and um, ended up coming out on International Women's Day, which was awesome. Um, and then the, the, the documentary is, is happening. I've got a couple of hurdles to jump through before that can hopefully kick off as well. And the beauty of it is, you know, we're sitting on all of this overseas footage and obviously the film industry and the TV industry, there's, you know, not going to be a huge amount of overseas stuff going on, I don't think. So, you know, hopefully that, that shall work in our favour. Yeah. Yeah. Why did you why did you say earlier you need to um you need to, you need to do a load of stuff to keep yourself busy? You need to keep yourself busy to keep yourself sane even. Why is that? Uh I got I've got quite a busy head and I get I I I need a lot going on. I jump from thing to thing. So my projects take quite a long time, but they kind of go in little cycles. So I'll jump onto one exhaust myself with it hop onto the next one exhaust myself by that then go back to the one before you know and that's sort that's sort of how I how I operate you know I don't know whether it, I often think is it just a massive lack of discipline or is it just that I need that different stimulation all the time um to keep to keep things fresh yeah I I, I have a similar thing where I need I need to I've got to be I've got to feel like I think that's what it is I've got to feel like I'm doing something productive all of the time every second of the day exhausting. and exhausting pardon it's exhausting yeah but I I don't know why that is uh, well I I've, I've sort of speculated recently that's because since leaving it's just uh, trying to find value in what I do and nothing you know nothing nothing will give me that sense of purpose thing again I think on a subliminal level yeah I'm, and I'm, and the other thing is, I was I was basically a service in cycles, so I mean cycles have been away either. Oh, in fact, it's actually, actually when I left as well. So when I go, so from twenty from two, so from the year two thousand to the year two thousand and fifteen, my life was a cycle of being away, doing you know con, like away all the time from the UK doing stuff, and then yeah. I come back and I do nothing when I'm back. It's R and R in inverted commas, or you know when I was in it was training for that stuff, and then go back out. So yeah. when I was back, it was okay to like have spare time and chill and do what you wanted to do. Now do what do what's relaxing because you've earned it. Earned it, yeah. And I know since me. the odd thing is that since the COVID thing has happened, since since it happened and it started, I, I right at the start I thought this is going to be hard. I'm gonna I, because I was going to have so much more time to myself, yeah. you know, in the house. Not traveling, not busy bodying around, doing this and other and meetings and whatever. That I, I sort of made a conscious effort to say you like you're gonna have to learn to be able to watch something shit on TV, you know, or read a book again, or yeah. or, or just do nothing. Just sit there. Just like do nothing. Yeah. <laughs> do nothing. Did you begin to enjoy it? I'm I'm still on the journey. Okay. I'm, I, I'm like I understand the value in it. I 100% understand the value in it. T taking a break, whatever it is you're doing, you know, be that one thing or be that a bunch of things. I see the value in it. It doesn't mean I find it easy, but I'm getting there. Like, yeah. I, like I can, I can sit there now and put a film on, <laughs> for example, if I'm on my own and and not and not have my laptop on my lap and my phone on my hand doing all different things I can sit there and go I watch just watch the film just just do one thing watch the film um I don't watch it all in one go mate. it's like it, it's installments of 10 <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah it's, it's a nightmare it's a nightmare but uh, do you, if you reckon like, though like, it's because go on. sorry go on no you go on uh, um just you know, when you talk about those cycles, you know, when you're in the six months, when you're away, you're you're kind of doing some high stress work there, aren't you? So that's got to elevate your your um, elevate the way you are. 
at that level of stress because you may be constantly trying to meet that. And if you're not meeting that level, it's just a bit mundane. No, I don't think so because I don't think so because the the four years I did in the Middle East after the military, yeah, um, was not stressful. It wasn't. It just wasn't. It just wasn't. Yeah. You know, but 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 I was working twenty four seven. There was never time off. You know, you it was it was sleep, eat, gym time if you can, work, sleep, eat, gym time if you can. And yeah, do you know what the other thing with it was? I, so I used to I used to get. Um, I used to come back. I, I, I think I think I was, a, I was a bit. I think I was a bit depressed anyway. Like mm. in sort of the last the, the last year I was out there. I think I was, and I was having. Uh, I, I've I kept noticing when I'd come back, I'd have quite significant mood swings. Not really low. I wouldn't get really low. I'd either be like operating on a normal level, mm. but then other times I would be giddy with I uh, not adrenaline. I, my my mouth would be racing. Blah, 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 I'd be talking away and just rapid, as if I'd had, as if I'd had like a bag full of jelly beans, right? Yeah, or that. I, I, I'd be racing, yeah. and um, it was, and, and then I would just crash like a sugar rush. But I would just crash. I couldn't, I couldn't work it out. And do you know what? I I ended up thinking. I thought it was bipolar at one point. <laughs> you know, you're investigating every single angle. Think, what is going on? Why is this happening? And then. Uh, it was only happening when I was when I was back in the UK. It was only happening at the back. And what I realised, what I think it was, is that when I was out on those last sort of four to four, five, six months on that last the last contract was on in the, in the Middle East in Iraq. The timings were rigid. My daily routine was absolutely rigid, like to the minute almost. So I can't remember the exact times, but I get up at five thirty in the morning. I'd have breakfast at six. I'd be on the site by the manager, like managing the site, securing the site. I'd be on the site by like seven. Okay, I'd be on. Then my then my lunch would get would be brought to me at twelve thirty on the site. Then I'd be off the site if uh, I'd be off the site at seven. My lunch, my dinner would be brought to me at five thirty. Yeah. There. Then off the site at seven, twelve hour shift. Then I'd go straight to the gym. I'd be in there by by like. Eight o'clock because the journey would take to get back from the site. Then I'd be in bed straight to sleep. It was the same every day. So what I think, that? no, you get a routine. And plus, I'm thrashing myself in the gym. I'm just thrashing myself. And and when I was at work, when it's like on the site, it didn't take a lot for me to do. So I'd be I'd be doing my own entrepreneurial busybody stuff on the laptop. Fair enough, making so the most time. Yeah, basically. And yeah. I was doing courses and stuff like that. But then when I came back, when I was coming back to the UK, I was not rigid with retirements. I was not, the biggest thing I think was the eating habits. Yeah. I, what, I was, I was just not eating this, the same like quality of food every day. Not that it was high quality in Iraq, but it was the same level quality. So my body could get to a, ah, we got the same thing here for months. Cool. Yeah. You come back to the UK and it's just all over the place. I think it was, I think that's what it was. Food. I think it was a diet thing. No, so no, no. Were you drink? Were you? Could you drink in Iraq or like in compound? In a compound or anything? Was it anything to do with alcohol as well? Because that sometimes does you. No alcohol. In a bit, doesn't it? Yeah, alcohol as well. I drink when I go back, but yeah, no alcohol when I was out there. There's no no drinking. It was rigid. Yeah, it was alright. It's quite. I mean, to be honest, it's a, it was such. It's easy money. <laughs> Just easy money out there. Really easy. But was it fulfilling? No, God, no. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I think like shelf should, like maybe only got a limited shelf life. Yeah, it, it, it does. But people, I don't think people see that. There's people that I I was working with back then, yeah. five years ago now, who had already been out there five years. They'll still be there now. The the problem is with it. It's when you get into a, that that rut out there of being in that that line of work. <laughs> It's really difficult to find anything else. It's really difficult to find something in the UK, right? And the yeah. longer you the longer you stay in that rut, the harder it becomes because it's there. Unless you rise up the ranks through the management positions to get to a senior level, which mm. is which is pretty rare to do from the bottom up because it's all mates rates out there. People are getting it, it most of the time. Unless you do that. Then you got zero next to next to zero experience or yeah applicable experience for the UK. 
that, nothing nothing yeah. that isn't the same as a security work like someone who does security here in the UK and the pay is never going to be near it is it well the pay the pay in the Middle East now is shocking anyway we're really bad most contracts are really really bad you learn more learn more labouring over here in the UK why do you think that why do you think that happened because I mean that was a that was a pretty cushy deal back in the day wasn't it security work it was it, it was it depended which contract you're on so mm-hmm. most of them were well paid back in the day now most of them are poorly paid uh, majority of it is so a, a lot of that a lot of that security work especially in Iraq is mm-hmm. you're doing it for the oil companies right. and you know it's a it's not a stable it's not a stable uh, industry especially right now mm-hmm. and over the years the pays the pay, their profits have gone down um all the costs have gone up Mm. And well, sorry, the revenue's gone down, or the costs have gone up, and uh, they 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 do the penny pinching, not not within first to do with the contractors, don't they? And the, the security firms contracted, yeah. so it's it's a cutthroat industry. It's hideous. It's hideous. But again, it's, when you get stuck in that rut, it's you can't. It's, it's very difficult to get back. Very difficult to get back and get a decent job in the UK. And I guess as well, it's if it's kind of guaranteed, and if you've got family at home that you've got to provide for. You know, I always think that's a that's a big thing for me is that I don't have a family to provide for. So I have the luxury of being able to live off a shoestring and, and disappear, you know, now and again when I want to without any concerns or anything. So I can imagine if you have a family, that's one mega big pressure to provide, which I don't envy, by the way. Yeah, but you, you say that. I mean, you perceive it as a pressure you've never because you've n- never been in it. But it's not a pressure when you're doing it because it's just life. It's like just it's, just, it's the same thing as oh, uh, I, I'll have I'll get a partner and we'll grow all together because that's what's done. <laughs> yeah, it's just you know I don't I'll have a family because that's what's done. And I don't think, but the but pressure you, <laughs> does, does that become you know that becomes your purpose, doesn't it? Because I always just think. So a couple of my girlfriends and I, because we don't have children, a lot of our friends do, <clears throat> their whole purpose becomes looking after their children. Whereas we don't we don't have that. So there's that sort of, you know, what am I doing with my life kind of thing? And you've got a whole new thing to be thinking about. Whereas the guys with the children, they'll probably have that little midlife crisis a bit later on when the kids flee the nest. Yeah, it's an interesting observation <clears throat> because um, because if you haven't got, let's take the family example. Let's take a mother. I, you know, yeah. You always, you always look at. You know, I don't always look at. But you see, the classic is the single mum with like a million kids, and she's got two or three jobs. You go, oh my god, how does she, how does she do it? Yeah. How does she how does she keep together? Because she's got no choice, right? Yeah. But she, she probably doesn't even think about it like that because it because her motivation and sense of purpose is it's, that's within it's like it's it's maternal it's there yeah. you don't you don't have to you don't you know you don't have to she doesn't it's not it doesn't feel like she's missing a sense of purpose um because because she's not but it's interesting that what you were saying there when you haven't when you don't experience that you 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 feel like you're missing that sense of purpose because you've not you have to artificially assign it. Find it, haven't you? You've got to try and work it out. Yeah, the weird, weird thing is not everyone needs it. No, I mean, gosh, I'm so envious of those people, <laughs> in a way. You what, sorry? And, yeah, I said the same thing. I said the same thing before. It's like, yeah. it, it would be, you know, sometimes I often think it would be a, a whole lot easier if I were wired that way, just to, to accept that life is going to work, paying your bills and all of that. But I, I do find that really hard to accept because I think there's just, there's more out there for me than just that. And I, I, I get a bit rebellious and resentful about, um, well, when I've done it in the past, you know, getting up every morning to go and do the same job in the same place. I was just like, everyone else was happy um, that I was settled in a job. But I just, I hated it. I, I loathed it and I loathed myself as well. So I thought, what am I doing? This is just keeping everyone else happy. Oh, good, she's settled. I'm like, oh, I wanted to strangle myself. But that's a, I mean, it's a relatively, it's a relatively, well, I'm going to speculate because I've only been around for 38 years. It's a relatively new thing that for like 
first world, um, no, not first world, for anyone, for human beings to think, there's more out there, what can I have? Because the only reason you know there's more, the only reason you know there's more out there that you can have is because of information. You know, it's like the tribe in the, the tribe in the flipping depths of the Amazon. Yeah. Right? Who, they live in mud huts, yeah? They have to go out and they have to hunt for their meals every morning. You know where I'm going. They have yeah. to hunt for their meals every morning, then they get the scoff in the afternoon, and then they may get attacked by another tribe, maybe, and then they're going to sleep, do the same thing. It's like the same thing. They don't want anything else. They're like, this is sweet. We've got everything we want. They don't need it, do they? They don't, they don't need it. I think, and sometimes I think we're just spoiled with choice. And, you know, I remember leaving university just thinking, oh, my God, it's a minefield out there. You know, I, don't, I, I did not feel prepared for, for that at all. Um, and I, I went to work for my dad. He, he sort of, want, you know, liked to have us close to him. So I did work for him, which I couldn't get on very well with because um, he was quite, quite a challenging man to work with. And so um, I begged him to let me study more, study law, which I did. And and uh, I don't know, it's just, I, I suppose it is what it is, the, the path you take. But um, I suppose I didn't want to do law unless it was in the army. And then obviously my army career was finished because I broke my back. And that's, I think, when the wheels came off and I started thinking, I just have no idea, no idea what to do because of the choice. Then I started thinking about the corona and the lockdown. So normally, spending six weeks at home, to be fair, I wasn't in London because I probably would have gone mad. Um, I did skip town um, for six weeks. Um, but because we didn't have a choice, I just accepted it. And I was like, okay, well, this is how it is. So I'll just get on with it and make the most of it. But, but actually, I was, do you know, I, someone told me about an experiment um, that they did in the supermarket, right? So you had a choice of three pots of jam and, it, and quite a few pots of jam sold, whichever one they chose, marmalade or plum, whatever. Then the following time they did this experiment, they put out 12 pots of jam, 12 different flavor choices. And not nearly as many were sold because there was too much choice. Mm. What does that tell you? Too, too much choice and you can't make a choice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's hard to make a choice, isn't it? When you're like... I know. Oh. I get... I get... You know, I, get <laughs> I, I get overwhelmed in a restaurant. So we go... <laughs> I go in a restaurant, ask, <laughs> ask, ask Kate, ask Kate next thing you see her. It'll get to the point where I'm, I'm, I'll have the menu. Uh, I'll have the menu looking and it's, go around and order everyone. I don't know. And I, I have to wait until they, and then it's at the point where I'd be pressured. The waiters there waiting to go, ah, I love that. I don't know. Because it's all so amazing. I think I just want everything on there. <laughs> I can't make a decision. I love a buffet. Because you get to bit yeah. everything and party food. You get a little taster of everything. Yeah. Do you know what? Interestingly, that's that's a that's a thing that 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 uh, decision making, man. I had I had a real block on decision making for about two years. Real block on it, and it was no longer than that, three four years, yeah. and it was in the aftermath of of separating from well my ex wife now, and uh, I don't know where it came from. I, it, I couldn't commit to I couldn't commit to a decision about anything. What? Like insecurity of something. Maybe it did it like know. force damage your confidence or self esteem or something. I don't know. I don't know what. I don't know. I don't know. It's just something I noticed. So I, I can't make a decision about it. I know. Really tough. Didn't really? want to. I'd avoid it. I'd avoid it. It caused me loads of problems. It caused me loads of problems. Um, lots of different things. Because I would just, it would be like, you know, an email come through to do with, for example, a bill. <laughs> yeah. I would just, no. I don't I pay it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then the bailiffs. Uh, is it? Hey? Then the bailiffs come. Yeah, basically. Yeah, looking out. No, but it is. I mean, it is interesting about how how we we changed, how we're changing the, the human race is changing as things go on. I mean, look, the thing is with that, the thing is with that wanting to do more, wanting to see more. That's relatively new, but then, but then, exploring and pioneering hasn't. It's like evolution is down to the fact that we over time have experienced different things it's new experiences 
you know, yeah. and, and and the ones who survived those new experiences are us now, you know, yeah. we, our ancestors, our ancestors. So we absolutely need it. Maybe with all this, we're going to evolve even faster because we're exposed so much more information and we're taking bigger leaps going forward. You know? Do you know what astounds me, though, Hugh, is that we are so highly intelligent in so many ways you know look look at the technology that we have and look how quickly it's advancing and science and all of this but what astounds me is the other side of us or our, our brains in the fact that like what's going on in america at the moment you know where the the our beliefs and our our sort of entrenched beliefs take so long to change you see what I mean? It's almost like that side of our brain can't quite keep up with our ability to create new technology. Right, America. Why? Why? Why you? What? Be, I don't understand what you're saying about America. There. Obviously, at the moment, we got the George Floyd. The we got the aftermath of the George Floyd thing going on. Right. Yeah, exactly. And those sort of entrenched belief systems that we have. Like what? And where they come from about race and uh, you know I I watched um, Blazing Saddles the other day. Have you seen it? Brilliant film. Yeah, brilliant film. Oh my god, did you see Green Book as well? No. Oh Jesus Christ, that really upset me. That book actually. It was about this. Um, Green Book. Green Book. It was about this um, gay black dude who was a phenomenal pianist, right? <laughs> And he had to get a driver, which was for, um, an Italian guy from from the Bronx or something. Anyway, the Italian had this massive prejudice against the black dude, right? But he did the job anyway. I think he was tight for cash or something. So he did the job. And driving around America so that this, this um, black pianist could play for all the white people. And... All the white people would go and watch him play, but they wouldn't speak to him afterwards or they wouldn't let him sit at the dinner table, you know? And it was just, it was so heartbreaking to see that. But then the Italian and the black guy ended up being great friends, you know, because they started, see, they started seeing past all of that. Have you, oh man, what's his name? Um, let me just find this guy's name. Two seconds. Daryl Davis. Have you heard of Daryl Davis? No. Right. Daryl Davis is a is a black musician. Um, right. He is from he's he's sixty he's sixty odd years old, right? And yeah. he is famous for converting Ku Klux Klan members away from the Klan. Oh, really? His story is unbelievable. Yeah, I, I, he went on the Joe Rogan podcast. I send you a link to it after this. <laughs> And he's, I think, he hasn't done a book, but he he basically, he grew up, he had like a really unusual upbringing for a, a black kid in America at that time. He grew up, he was in a, he was in a neighborhood where there was, there was no, I it, it was all black, right? Mm. But it, was, it wasn't that bad, the neighborhood. I'm not saying because it, it was black, it should bad. I'm just saying in that time, black people generally weren't very well off at all in America. Anyway, he grew up in an environment, right, where there was no racism, yeah. where he didn't see it. So everyone, he, oh, I tell you what it was. It wasn't in America. He didn't grow up in America. He grew up in, um, it was Europe somewhere. Yeah, black people, white people, it's all normal. Go to school with people. And then his parents moved back to the States. Oh, um, hey. Yeah. Yeah, and then is one of his, his early, his first experience of racism. He's like 12 or 13 years old, I think. And he's walking down the street to do to do with some. He's going with his school. He's doing something, and there's people shouting abuse at him. And he's going, yeah. "What? What? Why? Why do they hate me? I'm the same as them." He's like, he's never experienced racism, and yeah. that's his first experience. Is when he's old enough to to like judge it, not when he's a like a baby or a toddler or whatever. And he he ends up getting into R and uh, B and blues music, being a really good musician. It goes to a bar plays in this bar and he's part of a white group and plays in this bar and uh, there's 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 some drama because he's black it's a it's a Ku Klux Klan yeah. bar thing something like that long story short he ends up at a table talking to this guy 
Um, and this guy invites him to the table. He says, "I've never, I've never spoken to an N word before." Whatever he says, like this. Uh, but you're, you're. I never. Heard, that's right. He says, "I've never heard a, an N word like you play that music like that before." That was amazing. Sits down. The guy's a Ku Klux Klan member. Three years later, they keep talking, and he's and he's converted him, and he's kept in touch with these people. And he just talks to them because, like, I'm the same as you and me. And he's mega. Fit. You should. Uh, yeah. Donald Davis. Yeah, it's amazing. That. I have a, do you know it's it's funny I find I find I find race such a you know or racism such a fascinating thing um and I do like often so last year I was doing some delivery driving and I was working with this young black kid and we started talking about race and I said so you know what's the deal so he's got this white girlfriend and I said, do your, your parents all right with that? And they're like, yeah. And I was like, why would you go out with white girls? He goes, he goes, man, I would never go out with black girls. They're a nightmare. And I was like, really? He said, yeah. He said, I would always go out with white girls. And so, so it's really interesting when you actually talk openly and honestly to somebody who is a different colour, because we're all going to have different experiences, right? And then there was this other girl that I was working for. She was from... Um, her dis- descended from an African country. I can't remember which one. And I, we were chatting about race as well. And I said, so would your mum and dad, you know, not enjoy you bringing a, a, a white guy home? She said, no, they wouldn't mind that at all. What they would mind if they, they would mind if I bought, um, it was um, another uh, African country. I can't remember which. She said, if I bought someone home from there, they would lose it. And I was like, really? I was like, why? He said, she said, because they are just renowned for being lazy. She said they stick it in anything that comes along. And she said they would, yeah, I'd be disowned if I bought someone. But, but that there. makes sense. That, but that makes sense. Do you not see how that makes sense? Tell me what you're saying. Because that's fine. That, that discrimination is fine in my eyes. Yeah. Right, because it's not based on skin color; it's based on actions. It's like it—it's it, it, just what it is. It's just in this, yeah. uh, you know, in the same way that, uh, in the same way that a, I don't know, a Christian country might discriminate against a Muslim country, and a Muslim country might discriminate against a Christian mm-hmm. country, which absolutely happens, and that's just because yeah. of cultural differences that we perceive to be good or bad. That basically is what it's down to. Could you also go further and say, is it down to the leadership? Because I'll give you an example. I went to television. So I I met this this Israeli guy, Avi, um, when I was on the Isle of Skye. And then it happened that I was going to work on this cruise ship. And I stopped off in Tel Aviv and I stayed with him. And he showed me around Tel Aviv. And I was like uh, asking about the whole, you know, islam jewish thing and he said look he said we'll go to the um to the old oh, jaffa the old city he says you've got you've got jews you've got christians and you've got muslims all living together with no problem whatsoever he said it's the you know i can't remember if he said it all but we drew the conclusion that quite often it's more the leadership than actually what's happening on the ground and what's you know what's in the media as well well, the George Floyd thing is a prime example of that, right? So, mm. this is a, a, I, 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 I hate the way it's gone. I hate the way it's turned out at the minute because it's, it'll happen again. And it's what is going on at the minute is not relative to what happened to, to the situation. Now, George Floyd shouldn't have died. Those four police officers should be locked up and thrown away, the fucking key thrown away. Bust. That shouldn't have happened. Um, regardless of race, regardless of flipping what he's getting arrested for, anything like that, it shouldn't have happened, right? The problem is, is that his death, again, this is a problem with social media and the problem with, with news, right? Mm-hmm. With news media and how they have to survive through outrage. That death has been labelled as a racist, as, as, as due to uh, racism. We don't know that. I'm not yeah. saying it's not. But to say that he was treated like that because he's no, to say that he was killed because he's black is abs- which is what is being said, right? It's yeah. absolutely wrong. Do you know who's not saying that? 
Floyd, George Floyd's family. Do you know who's not protesting? George Floyd's family. Yeah. But the Black Lives Matter hashtag, which was brilliant when it first came out, like it was doing what it needed to do when it first came out due to a set of circumstances. It just, just, it's just been hijacked. It's just been hijacked by media because it creates headlines, by flipping Antifa bellends because it just creates headlines. And what happens is you get com- a complete disproportionate response. Why, why, is, why are there riots? And I don't care if they're peaceful or not, right? Why are there protests and riots going on in London on the Black Lives Matter, Black, Black Lives Matter thing as if the UK police did it? Why? Yeah. It shouldn't be happening. But and the reality is that the people... Sorry. The, ra- sorry, yeah. it was, it was, <laughs> the reality is that the people involved are getting out there and doing this. 99.9% of those people going out there with a placard, whether they're doing it peacefully or not, they ain't there because re- deep down, they really feel for what happened to George, George Floyd. Is it Floyd or Lloyd? Floyd. Floyd, I think. Sorry, I got confused myself there. Because they haven't even probably haven't looked at it in detail. They've just seen a fucking meme, not a meme, a hashtag, or a bunch, bunch of people, or the news posting shit. And, and then they've, and they've heard about, oh, let's get outside. Plus, at a time at the minute, we've got COVID on. People are frustrated anyway. Let's yeah. get outside. And they're just causing dramas. It's disgusting. It's, it's an excuse, it's, isn't it? I find that these things are quite are often an excuse. But aggravates me when... When these when these decent sort of well-meaning things get taken the wrong way and get taken advantage of, you know, like Me Too and things like that, and then all of a sudden, you, you know, you start thinking to yourself, "Come on!" And it's often just the few people; it's often the minority that turn it the other way. The, the, the thing is, the root, like, I look at the George Floyd thing again. Like, I'm not saying that racism doesn't exist. It is possible that his death was as a result of racism. It, it is possible, right? As in, let's take let's take the word racism out of this. As in, unwarranted discrimination, because you need discrimination as a survival tool. Discrimination is absolutely necessary, and sometimes you discriminate based on the way someone looks, whether what they're wearing or what the skin color is, depending on the context of where you, what your surroundings are and what you're doing, right? Yeah. If if uh, if if you're um, let's think about this. Oh, let's think of this. If you're a if you're a black person or a Muslim person and you go into certain parts of te- Texas, for example, or probably certain parts of the UK, for example, then where you know that they aren't particularly receptive of people of non white skin, yeah. then you can discriminate against people with white skin. You can look at everyone with white skin and see them as a threat, right? That's racial discrimination. But it's it's completely acceptable. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? it's completely acceptable, right? When you look at the, the situation in America, the reason it, it's really upsets me at the moment is it, it's painted, and it's and because it's in the UK now as well, it paints out it paints a picture that racism is still a hideously bad thing and hasn't changed in fucking decades or hundreds of years, right? Which absolutely isn't the case. It absolutely isn't the case. There are pockets, of, there are areas in the UK where there are absolute pockets of racism, and that's towards anything with different flipping skin colours, not just like towards black people. It depends where you go. And you're going to have that. Again, that discrimination. And there's pockets in America where it happens. You could say Northern Ireland even. In Northern Ireland. It's every country, Janie. It's every, just a, step. But it is not like, it's not like it was flipping 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, you know, mm-hmm. when, you know, you couldn't vote, you couldn't eat, especially in America, you couldn't eat in the same place as a white person. It's all that craziness. Well, yes. It wasn't long ago, right? The problem is, well, I mean, see, I look at the thing with, I look at the George Floyd thing with just that, right, how bad have the police got this now? Because, you, again, it comes to this, like, discrimination mm. thing. You have to discriminate sometimes, right? So... Let's say that, um, let's say people point to crime statistics uh, about, uh, yeah, but, but black people are more likely to be armed. Black people are more likely to commit violent crimes. Black people are this, but I'm talking about America. Black people are this, but, and depend change where, where, between the way you go. And, and, and the, the shallow minded think, oh, well, it's their fault. Well, it's just their fault. Mm. Well, but so then you, leave, so you, you take that forward to what happened to George Floyd, or maybe they treat them a bit more rough. 
be treated more roughly because he's a black person in that area than the tend to get more aggro. That's, that's on the surface, that would seem fine if you like, oh yeah, but look at this crime statistics. But in reality, the reason that that situation exists with those crime statistics and the poverty statistics is because the, the root, root, root cause is racism 200 years ago, 100 years ago. Yeah, that's it. It's what is causing it now. It's what is causing it now. Yeah. But it, but it's it's the thing to the thing to the thing that's important about it is it's not racism now that's causing it. It's a product of a, it's a chain reaction of things that happened years and years and years yeah. and years ago that we're doing everything within our power to UK and and US and and everywhere else have got forward thinking brain West world to to overcome, which is why you know they get the same rights as we do now. Mm. It's it's so hard. It's so hard. It, you know, there's an incredible book called um, Our Racist Heart, and it's by Jeffrey Beatty. And it's fascinating because it talks about our hidden prejudices, you know, prejudices that we don't even know that we have because they have just been collected from the gen from previous generations. You know, so I definitely had... Um, hidden prejudices that I didn't realize when I was in Oman about women in fact which is odd because I'm a woman but because of the way I was brought up I saw different things to what I was being told if you like you know with my my dad the alpha male and all of this so I think I took on some of those beliefs myself and I have to challenge those prejudices in 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 me that kind of inner conflict um, within within myself, and I think you know so often we do have these prejudices that we don't even know that we have until something sparks it off and you explore it and you're like where does this come from and then you question it you question its validity you know but I don't think we question. It. I don't think we question these things enough because we just take it as a given that this is how it is. You know, oh, that we don't even know we've sucked it up. You know, we don't even know that we've absorbed these beliefs. And that's kind of, I find that quite frightening because those are the really hard things I think to break. So, yeah, I mean, the hardest part is identifying you do it in the first place. Exactly. You know, um, I, I really, I, I got a member of the family, very, 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 very close member of the family, who shall not be named. I might have, I might have mentioned this person on the podcast before. So if I have, and people are thinking you've already said, you've already said about this person, then anyway, this person, I don't even, go, even give away the gender, right? This person, so has a has a prejudice within them. This is hard to talk without referencing gender. Has a, it's like talking about Sam Smith. Has a, has a. <laughs> This person will go shopping, right? And this person, I say will go. This is when I was a bit younger. Clothes shopping. We'll go, shopping. Just shopping, okay. right? <laughs> and this person come back, and this person would be telling me, like, an anecdotal, not anecdotal, but a story about the day and tell me how it went. And and I I could tell if, I could always tell if, there's a, if you, oh, I said she, fuck. Right. <laughs> So my mother, <laughs> yeah. my mother, right? Nice person on earth. Grew, grew up in, grew up in Ireland. Like I can say, it. the gloves are off. Grew up in Ireland, right? But she would come around and she and uh, she, it's happened a few times. She got the check out of a, of a counter, uh, a check out of checking out the shop. This is a regular story, right? It's a regular story. It's always the problem. And she gets to the counter, and she'll say, she'll say, "Oh, lovely lady, I think she was Indian." The person serving me. Um, and to be fair, you know, she was, she was, she was, she was being really nice to me and da, 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 thinking it's all, it's all, whenever she mentions a race, which isn't white, yeah, she is always followed up with, to be fair, like as if, you know, she's not as good as us, but she's trying. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, she's not outwardly racist. She's not, you know, she, she just isn't, she's not that person. That's also but, not but, her fault. Pardon? It's also not her fault. No, I look. There's they, you, what you're talking about is your is what you were talking about. You had a prejudice against women. That was from when you were growing up, right? Yeah. That's that's from your experience. That's, yeah. You also have that inbuilt. We have absolute 
evolutionary survival prejudice is built in. It's why when you're a kid, or even when you're a baby, and someone shouts, someone's nice to the baby, the baby's happy. Someone shouts at the baby, the baby cries. Because no one likes an aggressive person. It's why when you're a kid and you walk down the street and someone starts kicking off and getting angry, you're afraid of that. Why? You haven't you haven't been given the lesson on on what facial features dictate someone's probably going to get aggressive, going to hit you or not. But you know it all the same. You haven't learned that. You know it just straight away. You know. Yeah. Um, but it's muscle yeah. memory, isn't it? It's just. It's just a. I don't. I don't know. I think it's just. Crikey, it's all. It's quite mind-boggling sometimes. I think you know how we think we know ourselves, but really, I don't think we know ourselves at all until we really unpick it and look back and see where it comes from from our grandparents, how they behaved. You know, and, all and the, things. And the key is, and the key is, is that you find if you find something that is it's not acceptable and not not acceptable way to treat people in this day and age, you might be fine 20, 30, 40 years ago. It's not acceptable these days that you do something about it. And by you, it's like you, the individual, or the state. You know, it, it's. Uh, which is what's happening again. Which is like, which is why you, this breaks me about what's happening in America. It's, it, America is not it, the world is UK, UK, Canada, flipping Australia, flipping USA, and not the racist places people are making them out to be. And the the problem is that kids again, kids because they don't understand social media and they think everything on there is true. They're getting they're getting brought into this world where oh everyone's racist and the government are terrible and everyone hates everyone and it's a nightmare and you know mm. it's it's I don't understand it. there was a my 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 youngest now on instagram and she she uh, shared a story with me yesterday mm. and she said it upset her and it was a video that was it sent me this video right and um and the video was it was a it was they split the screen in two halves. On on the left hand side of the screen was a video playing. It was uh, George Floyd's arrest. You know the, that scene where they got the knee on his neck. It's that actually. Yeah. On the right hand of the, of the screen, um, they had, whoever had made it had, had, had taken clever clips of different things over the years. The first one was President Trump, right, Donald Trump, and it's him at some rally years ago on the podium talking and he's obviously made a gag about something and he's he's adjusting his tie and he's going i can't breathe i can't breathe and that directly next to the george floyd thing so it makes out as if he's making fun of him yeah and then there was a couple of other like millisecond clips video clips of um white people being aggressive to black people it was predominantly in like protest situations but again there's no context around it you don't know what it's talking about yeah. And uh, and she had watched it and thought and believed it and thought, oh my god, why 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 yeah. why is everybody so horrible to black people? When it's just not the case. It broke my heart. It's like flipping egg. It's the world isn't that bad. It happens, but it ain't. It ain't. Hmm? It's very powerful that when you see things like that, you know. That's why I look at the I look at the news now, and I just I don't. I don't know what to believe. I don't really believe any of it, to be honest. I just, I, I just, I, st I can't watch the news. It winds me up too much. I, I stopped um, watching it five weeks ago. Five weeks ago, I stopped watching isn't it? Yeah. It's really depressing. And actually, you know, so I was out in the countryside, but my brother was um, still having to come into London to work. And he said for, for the first few weeks, it was dead quiet everywhere. And then all of a sudden something just turned and he said, kind of feels like it's back to business now you know and when you're not out on the ground or you're locked away somewhere and not seeing it all you have is the news to you know to to know about it oh you know what so i was um i've been writing letters um to this um i, I don't know if you saw it on on instagram i became friends with this rear gunner from the Lancaster bomber I, I saw something about you writing letters but I haven't seen to who yeah, okay so I I started writing letters to him asking him about what it was like you know in the war and he said you know the thing is back then we had no access to information so everything was uncertain he said but you have so much information now the tv and you know it, internet and all of that and I I do have I do wonder 
what's the what's the nicer way? What's the what? What's the nicer way to to be, you know, access to all of this information, which is it, grains of truth in some instances, or just not knowing at all? I don't know. I'm. It's it, yeah. It's interesting. It's I was I've been thinking about. I think that last week. It's like what I'm missing, and there has been a couple of times I've wanted to go on and find out about something. So initially, when I I binned the news, it was probably about six weeks ago now. I, I, <laughs> I started following number ten down the street on uh, on Twitter and set alerts. So I thought because it was the, it was the COVID news all the time, and I thought right, if I just set the alerts to that, and I'll get notified when they tweet, I'll have a look, and I'll see what the the, the COVID news is. The yeah. COVID not news, the COVID facts as the government telling me. Brilliant, but then there is some stuff that. I thought I wanted to find out about that. I've looked specifically for it. But on the whole, I haven't missed what's going on. I th- Do you know what? It's, I, don't, I didn't bin it because I find it depressing. I binned it because I was so frustrated with... Um, so frustrated, and I'm so frustrated with how the news, the media, are, it's just switched, they've switched tactics now over the last few years to to align with social media in what gets people's attention. Mm. Outrage. Uh, that's what gets people's attention. Mm. Outrage, shock, awe. That's what people gets people's attention. Yeah. And it's and it's just completely impacted the quality of the news and it's made them more prone to talking rubbish. Mm. Talking absolute rubbish. You know, um and especially with like the COVID figures are concerned. It's like uh the news are reporting and I think they're all doing it, or the main ones were Every day they'd report the total number of deaths. The total number of deaths has gone up by, yeah, that's going to happen. But that's not the relevant figure. The relevant figure is, the relevant figure is um, the number. You know, the, not not the total overall. It's going to increase from from the start to finish. But it's how much how much has gone up compared to the day before. They weren't doing stuff like that at the start. It's just like flipping talking rubbish for outrage. It's same with uh, the same with um, these this riot situations going on. Absolute cack. I found that I really question the the statistics as well, um, actually, because I don't know. I just don't see how they can have. They're obviously a guide, but their accuracy I debate hugely because of the you know the lack of testing. So and people dying from other ailments but because covid was present or potentially present because they were breathing funny that it's put down to that you know where it could have been very easily something else that had had killed them really do you know so i just i don't i i i don't have complete faith in those figures no yeah the people was people were saying that they were recording deaths um as co- as a COVID death, uh, when like as exactly what you're saying there, but I think they were recording them as COVID related. Basically, what they were doing, I can see why I can see why they were doing it, and I but I can also see how I would make things in- inaccurate. Definitely, excuse uh, things. <laughs> hmm? excuse things, and then also, so one person gets tested two weeks ago, negative. What's to stop them having it two weeks later? But then they're not test do you know what I mean? there's it's really tricky i think i think it's i don't envy the government in this position either because nobody knows there's you know i think it's a really hard job that they've got really hard the the, the thing is 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 that they did people didn't know how what 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 it was capable of doing at the start and so you got to put worst case scenarios in it haven't you but then the um, other was wasn't it that well you saw excuse me you saw what happened to italy and yet you still waited you know, but is that, you know, is that based on hope sort of thing? Do you know what I mean? Like, or well, let's hope it doesn't happen. I mean, because ultimately those guys, they're only human as well, all these people. I don't know. I, I just don't know the answers. No, it'll be interesting when it's all over next year and see and see what see what all the all the statistics say from all the countries that are impacted by it. You know, but I, I you know, I've interviewed a couple of virologists now. Uh, not, no, I've interviewed one virologist and I interviewed. Yeah, I, uh, hmm? I watched that one. Oh, which one? The Welsh guy? Oh, um, Ian. A virologist. Hancock. Yeah. Uh, and I interviewed a guy called Andy Hall, 
and the oil MBE, who's um, an infection infection control. I call him an expert. He, he so he deployed to Sierra Leone for four years, right at the start of the Ebola outbreak there. Oh, um, that, yes, that, that that was the one. That's the one, right? Yeah, not Welsh. Yeah. <laughs> and though you know, and I also interviewed uh, the the ICU nurse from Scotland, um, and uh, they're all they It's all real, real to them. It's not. It's yeah. not. The, the conspiracy theory is that it's does it's not as not as bad as what people say or or it doesn't it doesn't impact people the way they say it do it it does like the deaths are real you know the the flipping people who contract it is real and the stress in the hospitals is real I've got to make there's a paramedic in London who's been flipping maxed out it's it's hard to see the woods for the trees out the minute isn't it I because, yeah it really is I think it's the it seems like the fallout from it may well be worse you know the ongoing medical conditions that people suffer also the people that were avoiding the hospital who were potentially very poorly you know who knows but I don't I don't think we're going to know until quite a few years down the line I think it's going to take longer than yeah, years. Not. yeah when we're, we're in the middle when we're in the middle of a recession yeah isn't hindsight a wonderful thing mm-hmm. yeah definitely how did we get on to that how did we get on to that I, I have no idea Covered it all so far. Klu Klux Klan, COVID, <laughs> R&B and blues, yeah. <laughs> racist. <laughs> do, you, do you know what? Okay, I'll, I'll give you one. Have you heard of um, Albert Camus? This is, a, this, this is how I see life, right? Albert Camus. He was a, uh, a philosopher who um, sort of, champions I guess absurdism you know and it's basically the um life is pushing a big rock up a mountain and it falls down again and then you push it up again to the top of the mountain and it falls down again and that is just that is just how we live and it's absurd but then once you get to that point of thinking yeah it is all kind of absurd that's when you can start having a bit of fun (laughs) you know God, no, I don't know. Rock up and then the rock falls back down. Yeah, it was one particular story that he wrote. What a horrendous way of looking at it. The, uh, the absurdist philosophy. And that's what I think all of these things are. They're like, the, that, that's how it, how it feels to me, met- metaphorically in a way. You're, we're always constantly, there's always, you know, you get to the top of the hill, you hallelujah, and then something else crops up and you've got to go back up the hill again. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, yeah, and a lot of that at the moment might just might be just perceived problems because if again information, I mean, maybe we should go back. Remember when I was we were talking about um, talking to my dad about Brexit <laughs> before Brexit before the vote had happened, um, and um, I'm, he was talking about Leave Remain, and I and I and I said. I think I said something like, look, people people are going to vote on this just by what they're reading in the news. Not actually going to think about how it affects them, like, directly. So yeah. people should just, when you're going to vote, think about how, you know, when you're looking at a, an immigration law, for example, yeah. or something that's being proposed, you know, could or couldn't happen if we Brexit or not, then think about how that is going to affect you in your life, in your village, or in your town, wherever you are. And judge it on that, not on what you read in the news. Just judge it on the heart, like, exactly. What do you think? How's it going to affect you? People don't do it. It's, you know, it's like a, it's, it's the same thing now. Just how does it affect you? What are you reading in the news? Does it affect you that bad? Why are you getting so mad about it? Why are you getting frustrated about it? You know, it's, you know uh, I'm not I'm not about the George Floyd thing. <laughs> the Brexit thing was actually up, um, uh, my reactions to it. So before I, the whole thing was going on, I was like, I was happy to leave. Um, for what reasons? I don't. I don't even know. I don't. This is the thing. I don't even know enough about it, and I don't think anybody really did who vote. You know, who voted probably, or or there's only as much as you can know, and I didn't know much. Um, but I don't know. It just felt like the right thing for me, and then I moved to France, and I thought, oh, actually, Remain would have been better. 
because my circumstances has changed and how it affected me had changed. Do you know what I mean? It's like, oh, bugger. What if I want to stay in France now? Oh, it's going to be a bit of a pain. You know, and then I was just like, oh, dear. <laughs> it's not, we are so damn fickle, you know? And I'm like, guilty, absolutely hands up guilty of being fickle. Um, try not to be, but, you know, human, isn't it? Human nature. Yeah. Try to Sorry. be now, but... <laughs> <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's all right to change your mind though as well, isn't it? It's like that's the other thing these days. It's like you're not allowed to change your mind. Um okay. or contradict yourself. I contradict myself all the time. All the time. No, I, it's fine. It, this yeah, is this make up my mind because I see something from one point of view, then I see it from another point of view, and I just can't I can't it's that indecision. I can't make up my mind because I see things from so many different points of view, and then they're all valid. Yeah, and and you you evolve and you grow as a person, and and unfortunately, I mean this is, it happens in politics, it happens slipping all over the place with different things. I mean, you, you, it's frowned upon to change your stance on something. When why why should that be the case? I've yeah. learned some something more. My opinions changed. You know, the Brexit, the, the Leave Remain thing, the the um, what are the examples that, examples at the minute? The conservative and Labour, red and blue rubbish. It's like, you know, it, it's not a drama. It's not a drama. And to kid yourself, and, and the reality is, if, you, if you're going to deny yourself the ability to change your mind, then you're going to be a very fucking unhappy person for the rest of your life. Because yeah. you're going to be living a lie in a lot of things. You're going to be just doing what everyone, what everyone else, you think everyone else wants you to believe and do it, do, do and say. And it's not the way you should do things. Do you know what I take issue to, actually, is the... Um is the way that politicians speak to one another. Okay, so they're like, they're supposed to be leaders of the country. And we teach our children, or parents teach their children, to be polite to one another, don't they? And yet you've got the leaders of the country, the people who you would hope to be decent role models, and they're all jibing each other, and I just find it so incredibly pathetic, to be honest. It just Do you know who I really, there was, um, I remember listening to Johnny Mercer once, and he said, and this was just so lovely to hear, he said, I don't care what party you're from, if you've got a good idea, I want to work with you. And I was just like, kind of sums it up, rather than bitching and shouting at one another, actually work together and get something achieved, you know, and drop the ego, drop but because the, of the crap and get on with it. Because of the party set up, it doesn't work. We're like, oh. we're operating, the government, it's the same in America and same in other places that have got a government and do and can vote in the way we do it now, or the way we have, we've always done it. It's outdated. It's not needed. It's like, it's, it's and there's so much room for corruption with it. And self um, and um, self interest with it, it's it's, it's oh man, I mean look, the reason we got MPs, the, reason we got, the only reason we got MPs is because back in the day we needed people to go from the town, go to the government, in go to Parliament and say yeah, uh, Neath or Warwick or flipping uh, London think this or this borough of London think this. There was no way of conveying the message, mm. no way of conveying. Why are we still doing it? Why are we still doing that? Why does it take? Why does it? Why is it? Why does it take like raise a petition six months to get something done? A petition for anything, getting a new, a widening a road, put in or whatever. It doesn't need to happen, but, and it just allows more room for corruption, bribery, um, emotional manipulation, flipping blackmail, everything else. By the time, by the time the idea gets to Parliament, and it, it's, uh, it's bollocks. It shouldn't happen. It, it shouldn't be anyone like that. Put up. But then also, there are so many people who need jobs. Do you know what I mean? So quite often, all those so layers, 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 layers. Well, we've got, what what other jobs do people do if we do not create these layers of jobs and bureaucracy? Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a money and a power thing. I mean, look, what... Look at look at let's let's think about something here. Let's think about something. Let's take the Brexit vote. Right. Right. Um, why? Why? In fact, any vote, 
anything, any decision. Why can't it be? There's no, there's no MPs, right? You got the, you got the government app on your phone, right? The flipping yeah. democracy app. You got the democracy app, and it flags up, right? It flags up, and it says, uh, um, "Mrs. Mabel, Mrs. Mabel, around the corner, who's got the, who's got that like mini supermarket thing, local supermarket kind of thing. She wants to widen the road, yeah, and and." And you, this flashes up in your phone, Jenny, because yeah. the algorithm has decided that, okay, if that road was to widen, that would potentially affect this postcode, this postcode, this postcode, this industry, and these companies. So they should all get a say. Yeah. And, it, and that goes, duh, duh, flashes up. It goes, Mrs. Mabel wants to, duh, 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 duh. you've got two minutes to vote yay or nay. Two minutes. So it's like, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not going to issue that. You say no. Or, if, or, or you say, uh, sorry, yes. Or if you have got a shit, you say no. And then it all gets put together. And it gets decided straight away with no, like, no fucking bribery. No going around and talking rubbish. Oh, if you widen the road, 600 bats will die because of the, the blah, 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 blah. It's decided on the facts right there and then. No bullshit. Done. How quick is that? Right? You can do the same with, you can do the, same with the voting. Like, part, voting people in. You can do the same with any of it. Do you know what, Hugh? I think as with Every single idea, there are pros and cons to all of them. <laughs> are there? There's an argument for and against absolutely everything. I'm you could sure. You and could wait it. That's confusing. Listen, I give this thought, right? You could wait it. So yeah. if like the, it, the the software could decide how important or like how impact how how much of an impact that will have on like the UK or certain element economy or education or whatever. And the higher an impact it could have, then the longer you get to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know what I mean? Yeah, but who decides the who decides the length of time? Somebody's got to decide the length of time. Well they've decided the algorithm. And you don't have you don't have um you don't have you don't have a leader anymore. You don't need it. You don't need a leader anymore. You have a figurehead you have a figurehead. Of, listen, I've got it nailed. You have a figurehead of the of the country, right? And this person yeah. is elected via the software, right? Nominate someone in your. You need to nominate someone uh, to um, be the leader of the party, right? And then a uh, leader of the party, leader of the country, and then you nominate someone in your app, and they all get filtered down. Nominate, 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 nominate vote in the stage, vote in the stage, done. And then within a the day, Joe Smith down the road has been voted as a, as the co- as the spokesman for the country. It's like fucking hell, what's happened? All his job is to do is to be the spokesperson to other countries. Donald Trump comes or Angela Merkel comes to, to Joe Smith and says, Joe, um, we would like to strike a deal with you where we can increase our fisheries, fishery like deal. I don't know. I, I don't do that stuff. You get the idea. And Joe goes, uh, no problem, uh, Angela or Mrs. Merkel or whatever. And he sticks it in the app. And he goes, right, this is what Germany want to do. It's going to be quite significant an impact in the UK. So uh, I'll give, uh, you got a day. And he sends it out. And the whole of the UK gets it. Now, fuck off, Merkel. And they say no. Or most of them say no. <laughs> done. It's done. It's like, no, the country decided. Everyone truly gets their own, truly gets their own say in it. Fantastic. Absolutely. I, I mean, I like it. I think it's worth, <laughs> I think it's worth an experiment. Because, I don't know, can it, can it be? any better or worse than what it is now I'm not I don't, I don't know I don't know but I tell you what I did go to this hippie gathering last year and uh, it's called rainbow gathering and uh, <laughs> there's no leaders yeah and there's um everyone just sort of mucks in together but there's these sort of rituals that go on around the um around the fire which is lit from new moon to new moon or something and uh it actually, this one particular was one in, was in Gloucestershire, but they're all over the world, so I couldn't speak for the other ones. But, but it was interesting to observe. You know what I mean? I was only there for about twenty four hours, um, but it was yeah, it was interesting to observe how the community of which there was maybe a hundred people all helped each other out you know, and shared skills and, and, um, and all of this. But it, it, for me, it was a little bit, um, a little bit too hippie. Do do you know what I mean? That sort of 
stereotypical kind of hippie, which I it's it's fine. It's no like you know everyone's got to do what, sort of what what makes them happy. But it was it was an interesting thing to observe that kind of that way of of living. Yeah, luckily it works works until you get to the stage. It depends on how far you want to take whatever organisation you're part of. You know, you need organisation and leadership to to succeed yeah. in whatever you're doing, don't you? Well, apparently, um, it didn't go that well in Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's a little bit of an uprising at the Portugal one, but <laughs> um, but I think as I said, that's people, and isn't it? And I think sometimes you only just need one sort of bad egg with a big ego or big beliefs, dogmatic, whatever. And it's amazing how that one person can disrupt a whole community. Do you know, I saw it in the horses. When I was looking after the horses in France, I had eight of them, and there was one little Welsh mountain pony, and he was a sod, boo, his name was. And he was the mega disruptor of the herd. And it was so, and I, I really did, and the same as the dogs, because we had about eight dogs there as well. And I just thought, my gosh, you, this is just like people, apart from they don't speak and communicate like we do, but you, you observe their actions and how they behave towards one another. And, you know, you've got the sort of quiet, shy, timid one that just gets bullied. And then you've got the loud one who's kicking everything, trying to steal everyone's food. Um, and then you've got the one that might kick back, but sort of gives up because they just think he's never going, he's relentless. He's never going to stop. So we may as well just shut up and not bother, you know, cause you, you get bored of fighting. And it was the I find, I find the people and the the animals are not so dissimilar. No. No. And that's quite no. often why I hide myself away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We've uh, we've gone for an hour and twenty minutes. Have we really? Yeah. Anything you want to cover before you knock it on the head? Crikey. Um, what haven't we? What haven't we covered? <laughs> what haven't we covered? Oh, geez. Um, no, just watch this space for the for racing heroes and eighty. No, it's exciting. And yeah, you know, yeah. um, and once we're once all this is over, you know, we're we're really keen to get cracking and get more guys and girls involved. Um, cool. You got a website set up yet? Yeah? It under construction at the moment. Okay. So I hope, fingers crossed, all going well. It goes live next week. What's the URL going to be? Uh, I think it's I think it's racing heroes.co.uk but I, I have to check that. Or maybe I'll send it over to you and pop it on well, there. This will go out, it won't go out straight away. I've got a few weeks, so I, I'll touch base with you and get the link in the blurb for this. Okay, yeah, that'll be cool. That'll oh, yeah. Be cool. Um, yeah, because yeah. it's a big, exciting thing that's 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 happening especially with the 81 because you know i think we're aiming we signed the armed forces covenant as well so we're aiming for um we're aiming to take on a lot of veterans brilliant in that's very good in all sorts of roles not just yeah. not just racing very good science yeah I'll see you down at see you down at silverstone at some point yeah, man, love to. <laughs> Will you just come down with us one day? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Love to do it. Love to do it. Awesome. Been a pleasure. Q, it's been lovely to see your face. <laughs> Not hear the words. <laughs> <laughs> and when when lockdown's over or whatever happens, we shall we should meet. Yeah, I think there's going to be. I reckon there'll be a big RV in the bike shed at some point. Oh yeah. Guaranteed. Yeah. Anyway, bye. <laughs> We're gonna hit stop. All right. Godspeed. Pleasure. Bye.